magnify him together. Let's lift our hands and praise the Lord. God, we worship you. There's within my heart a melody. Jesus whispers sweet.
praise him together. Thank you, Jesus. Praise the name of our God. All names the one who reigns forever. Still the same.
Brother James, I know he's missing his dear little wife and sweet little baby as they're away. Amen. Helping out. But uh, let's just pray and, he, and for this man of God as he brings forth the word of the Lord. Don't you enjoy the great preaching we've heard from Brother James? Amen. He's going to come and take the pulpit and go ahead. Hallelujah. And we're going to amen him and praise the Lord right along with his preaching tonight. So I say praise the Lord. I thank Pastor for the opportunity to speak and to minister as always. It's something that I do not take lightly. And I'll ask you guys to have a little bit of patience with me tonight as I am going to perhaps step out of my comfort zone and and, and just I don't know. God, God wants me to feel, I feel that it's just something I've never done before, what I'm going to do. But just be patient with me and help me because it's not about knowledge or having notes or sounding good, but it's about being obedient to the word of God and the voice of God. And so just be patient with me, work with me and pray with me. Before I start, I just would like to say with this, there's often times in, in scripture and in life and I would say the majority of the time that God does not tell us where we're going. God doesn't tell us how we're going to get to the promise. Sometimes he doesn't even tell us where the answer is. But what he does do is he gives us something to remember. What he does do is he gives us something to think on, something to look on, something to hold in your heart on that journey to the promise, something to hold inside of you on that way to the promised land. And tonight, I'm just going to read out of Deuteronomy 6. And I'm going to read the whole chapter. And throughout the chapter, I'm going to, we're going to stop and pray and meditate and, and think on Scripture. Because I believe with all my heart that the words that were spoken in Deuteronomy about the move, moving into the promised land, I, I believe that they're still true today. They might have been for a different culture and context, but I believe if God led the way to the promise in, in, in a certain way that he will lead it again. I believe that as God led Egypt out of the church and he gave, uh, I mean, he led Israel out of Egypt and, and gave them the law, gave them the word of God, and, and, and he performed miracles, signs, and wonders. I believe that God is moving the church out of the world. I believe that God is moving the church out of the oppression of the world and in to the promised land because I do believe Jesus is coming again but before he comes I do believe that we're going to enter into a time and a, and a season of divine promise and divine harvest and, and a land that is flowing with spiritual milk and honey a land that has houses and cities in which we did not build and, and vineyards and trees which we did not plant but I believe that there is a process to get to there and sometimes God doesn't tell us Exactly, step by step, but he gives us some things to remember. So if you could turn to Deuteronomy 6, I'll obviously start in verse 1. And to just give a little backstory to this, the, the Ten Commandments were just stated. And God is exhorted to Israel. And he, he's speaking through Moses to keep his commandments. Some people would argue that we're not under Old Testament law, but I believe we are still under the Ten Commandments. I believe that we, we're not under ceremonial law. Thank God we're allowed to eat bacon, even though it might not be the best thing for us, but thank God we are. Thank God I don't have to bring a sheep in or an animal in that I'm allergic to every Sunday morning to have a sacrifice so I can be forgiven. Thank God. Amen. But I do believe that 
Well, all the Old Testament scriptures and the law of Moses was fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Amen. I do believe we still operate under the Ten Commandments. I think this, I think it's a reasonable observation. You know, you shouldn't kill. You know, you shouldn't have any other gods. You shouldn't commit adultery. These are just basic principles that I, I feel like we don't need an explanation for. We just should know we're under this and we live by this. So it's in Deuteronomy 6 and 1. It says, now this is the commandment, and these are the statutes and judgments, which the Lord your God has commanded to teach you that you may observe them in the land, which you are crossing over to possess. Which land were they crossing over to? It wasn't another house of bondage. It wasn't another place of sin or a place of uncertainty, but it was the promised land. And here, like I said before, God wasn't giving them a bunch of how-tos. He wasn't giving them a, a five-step way into the promise, but what he was saying is here's some things to remember on your journey. Here are some things that you can observe when you're in this land that you may fear the Lord your God to keep all his statutes and commandments, yes. which I command you and your sons and your grandson all the days of your life and that your days may be prolonged. Therefore, Hear, O Israel, and be careful to observe it. Be careful to practice it. Be careful to take part in this. Be careful to, to diligently, actively walk in what I'm telling you. Why? That it may be well with you. And that you may multiply greatly as the Lord your God, as the Lord God of your fathers has promised you. A land flowing with milk and honey. If we could stop there and pray for a moment. Because I believe the purpose of Israel was to multiply. But I believe the purpose of the church is to multiply. And if we're going to move into multiplication. There are some things that we have to observe. This, this day and this hour of a modern Christianity would like to tell us that we do not have to observe and practice things. To enter into a position with God. But there are some things according to the word of God which must be kept which must be observed and we cannot nullify the fact or dismiss, dismiss the fact that we have a covenant with God just as much as Israel had a covenant with God and we have to be obedient just as much as they were obedient I have to give just as much as Paul gave if I don't why would I think that God would have special favor on me just because I've been living in a certain day and a certain hour. So if we could pray for a moment and just think on what God is speaking, let me be carefully observe. Father, I thank you, Lord. I thank you for your word. I thank you for your love. God, I pray the law that you gave us. I pray the word of God that you gave us. I pray those words that you spoke thousands of years ago, moving into the promise. God, I believe that they are still applicable today. God, I believe that you are moving and destining your church into a promised land, which is a spiritual promised land. God, a land that is flowing with milk and honey, a land that is flowing with provision, a land that is flowing with things that you are moving your church through a time and a, and a wilderness to, to cleanse and to allow a, a, a season to bring the fear of the Lord, to bring understanding, to bring an observation of your law. God, I pray like never before that your church will learn to be obedient. I pray that you will speak to my heart, God, tonight to learn to be obedient to your voice, to learn to be obedient even when we don't understand where we're going. Just be obedient in what you have spoken. And it goes on into verse 4. It says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, Amen. with all your soul, and with all your strength. I feel like that needs no explanation. It just means that God requires everything. It's not just a little here and there, but it is everything. If sometimes if you feel like you're just doing too much, sometimes, yeah, you're probably doing too much, but sometimes you're doing what God requires you to do. Because sometimes giving everything is hard to give. Sometimes it's hard to be obedient to give that last $5 when you don't know where your food is going to come from. 
Sometimes it's hard to be obedient to, to Judas and, and, and to love Judas and to keep Judas and to pray for Judas when you know that he'll betray you. Sometimes it's hard to give everything when it feels like God is so distant and so far and you're walking through this wilderness and you wonder, does God even see me? God spoke these words to me. God spoke these things to me. But this is when that you must keep it. It must hold on. It must observe the law and observe the words and observe the commandments that God has spoken. Observe the things. Observe the promises that he's given to your life. If it's that your family would be saved, don't give up when you're walking through a wilderness. But hold on to that promise and love God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. Yes. Verse 6, and these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. What words? What, what, what things? It's the law. It's, the, it's how to live. It's how to act. It's how to walk rightly. It's what you should do when you're in the promised land. Because we're not going to get there accidentally. You know, heaven is a prepared place for a prepared people, but revival is a prepared thing, and the outpouring is a prepared thing for people who want it and actively seek it. You don't just stumble upon revival. Amen. The disciples did not just stumble upon the day of Pentecost. They did not just stumble upon the upper room, but it was carefully observant in a prayer room when God didn't hear them. Amen. For 10 days, if, I imagine if I was praying for 10 days, that I think, God, are you listening? <laughs> Jesus, maybe you're on vacation up there since you just got back. You told me that you were going to send the Spirit. Yes. But they were carefully observing their, their, the Azusa Street revival. It wasn't just an accident. It was carefully by prayer and, and examining the Word of God and saying, if this is real, let's try it out. And we're going to observe it. We're going to keep it. We're going to practice it. People who didn't even believe the stuff that they were about to experience. But they found it in the Word of God. There's a revival of sorts taking place right now in the university. It started on Wednesday. I don't know if you've seen it, but I believe it's the Osbury revival. They're starting to call it. The group of students started praying on a Wednesday morning and they have not left and it's grown to hundreds being saved and hundreds having miracles and signs and wonders. Being, preserved, being performed. But it does not just accidentally happen. You do not just accidentally enter into the promise. And in verse 7, you shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way, when you lie down and when you rise up. Can I say something that has convicted me lately? I, I do branch out and talk into different religions. And one thing I've noticed, particularly about uh, an Islamic faith, is that they talk about God a lot. I would say sometimes even more than Christians. I know at least more than me. I have a Muslim friend and almost every other sentence he mentions, God, unapologetically. This is a man that I claim that does not have the full truth of God. He doesn't have the truth that I have, but he's observing in a way that I'm not observing. But it's saying today as it was then, we must diligently teach them. We must talk of it all the time. We must hold this all the time. When we sit in our house, it shouldn't be about what's going on, but it should be about God. When we walk by the way, when we lie down, when we rise up, everything should be revolving around what God has spoken and what God is doing. He says, you shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Let's just pray there. I'm going to ask that we we'll all pray and ask God. Is his laws and his commands and the promises and the things that he spoke to us, are they still on the doorposts of my heart. When I examine my heart, do, do I see bitterness 
uh, that I'm not where I need to be right now. Uh, and when I go through the gates, do I go and, and I see things given for the words that he's spoken? Or do I see something that is, is sad and, and down because I'm not where I think I need to be? Church, let's pray and ask that God would help us to realign our doorposts and our gates and our vocabulary and our speech to be in accordance to the word of God. Jesus, we come before you once again, God, to meditate on your word. Lord, I pray that you will examine our hearts. I, I pray that you will examine our gates. I pray that you will examine our doors, God. I pray that in, in the gates of our lives, yeah, metaphorically speaking or, or figuratively speaking, God, I pray that we will find thanksgiving in those gates. Thanksgiving that is thankful for what you have done. Thanksgiving that is thankful for what you have spoken. Thanksgiving that is thankful for who you are. And I, I pray that in the doorpost that we will find the commandments that we diligently keep, God. I, I pray that in the doorpost we will often think of, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. God, I pray that we will often think in our heart at that doorpost, God, of the sacrifice that you made on Calvary. God, I pray that you will create in us a new heart and renew a steadfast spirit in us, God. Do not cast us away from your presence, God, but restore the joy of your salvation. Lord, let it all happen according to your word and your glory. And everyone said amen and go into verse 10. Verse 10 starts at it says, so it shall be with you. So it shall be when the Lord your God brings you into the land which he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give you large and beautiful cities which you did not build, houses full of all good things which you did not fill, hewn out wells which you did not dig, vineyards, vineyards and olive trees which you did not plant. When you have eaten in the full and are full, then beware lest you forget the Lord your the Lord. Get forget the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. Church, this is something that we need to remember not only in the promise, not only in the outpour, not only in revival. But we must remember this always, that we cannot forget the Lord who brought us out of the world. Amen. We cannot forget, and it's so easy to forget, maybe not for you guys, but it's so easy for me to think I've been a Christian my whole life and, and think I've done it, my, done it the right way. And it's so easy for me to forget what God did for me not long ago, that he brought me out of a land that I was a prisoner in. That he brought me out of that house of bondage. He brought me out of that house of sin and that place of shame and that place of despair. It's so easy to get caught up in where I am and forget the Lord who brought me out. The church, we need to beware lest we forget the Lord. It wasn't my efforts that took me out of the world. It wasn't anybody else's efforts. It was, there's no glory to anybody but God. There was no glory to anybody but God for what he did in Israel. Amen. It could not be given the glory to Moses. It, the glory couldn't be given to Aaron. It couldn't be given to the Israelites and how fast they ran. But God organized it in such a way that the glory could only be given to him. So we need to beware lest we forget the Lord who brought us out of the land of Egypt. You shall fear the Lord your God and serve him and shall take oaths in his name. You shall not go after the other gods and the other and the gods of the peoples who are all around you. I'll be transparent for a second here. I do feel the say this. But today we don't struggle so much with open idolatry. We don't struggle so much with Going and worshiping another God is not, I don't know, maybe it's not, maybe it's just me, but it's not a temptation for me to go and, and, and serve and worship Buddha. It's not, it's just not a temptation for me. Right. But there is a temptation of having other gods and other things before the one true living God. Yes. 
The other day I was praying, it wasn't too long ago, and I'm being transparent for the sake of just being open about things that we face in life. But I was praying, and it's almost like God spoke to me and said, I don't want to talk to you. And I thought about it and I prayed about it for a day. When I went back to my prayer time the next day, God said, I cannot talk to you because there's things in your life that I'm not comfortable with. And I said, what? I, I, I said, what do you mean? I said, God, I'm not sinning. I'm not, I'm not going out and, and drinking and smoking and doing all these. I'm not a thief. I'm not a murderer. I'm not doing bad things. And he said, what about the distractions, James? He said, what about what you're entertained with? It may not be wrong, but are you consumed by it? And God asked me a question, which I had to examine it on myself. He said, are you more entertained by the things of the world? Are you more entertained by the things that, that, that just flash before your eyes temporarily than you are entertained by my word? Because while it may not be a temptation to go and serve Buddha, there's a very there's a very real temptation to just endlessly stroll or endlessly watch or endlessly consume what this world would have for us. While it may not be wrong to have the media, it may not be wrong to watch videos, it may not be wrong to listen to certain things, but it cannot entertain us more than we let God entertain us. And it's so easy to fall in that trap and fall into that hole. And verse 15 tells us why. It says, for the Lord your God is a jealous God among you. God's not going to share your attention. God's not going to let you give half to this and half to that. He's a jealous God. He wants it all. He's not satisfied with you just being partially entertained. And there's a, there's a struggle in, in the 21st century, especially for the young men and the young women that are in here, is to be so entertained by the world and become consumers of the world and to become consumers of things that don't appear wrong and lose sight while you're still acting right. I was still reading my Bible. I was still praying. But I was not as entertained by it as God wanted me to be. And that, that is what the struggle is now. It's not a struggle to go and to worship Buddha or to worship Allah or to worship all these other false gods. It's not a struggle for me to go and become a Hindu. That's not a temptation I face. But what it is is a struggle to not put other things before God and not become consumed with other things. If you're more excited to go to a hockey game than you are a church, if it, it, if you're given more to Tim Hortons than you're given to God, if you're given more to your Netflix subscription than you're paying your tithes, do you have a God before you? I don't know. These things aren't wrong in and of themselves. It's not wrong to get a coffee. It's not. I don't believe so. I don't see scripture against drinking coffee. But when things come before God and you're more excited for things of the world, it can become burdensome and God does not want to put up with it. He says, lest the anger of the Lord your God be aroused against you and destroy you from the face of the earth. Thankfully, God did not do that to me. But it's a very real reality. God could snap his fingers and poof us all out of existence if he wanted to. I'm thankful that he doesn't. But we have to beware lest we do not forget God and become consumed with other things. It says in verse 16, you shall not tempt the Lord your God as you tempted him in Massa. You shall diligently keep the commandments of the Lord your God, his testimonies and his statutes, which he has commanded you. And you shall do what is right and good in the sight of the Lord, that it may be well with you. So everyone say, well with you. Well with you. This is why we do it. It's not just because it's the right thing to do and the good thing to do, but there's a blessing in observing. There's a blessing in keeping. There's a blessing in following the statutes and the, and the testimonies and the laws and the commands of God is that it will be well with you and that you may go in and possess the good 
land which the Lord swore to your fathers. It's when we pay attention to carefully observe these things. It's when we diligently keep these things that God can entrust us to walk in to a land that we did not build, a place that we did not work for. It's when we can follow him in doing nothing and follow him in when everything's wrong that he can trust us to follow him when everything's going right. You know, it's a, it's a hard place to walk through the wilderness, but I'm convinced that if you can walk through the wilderness, if you can be faithful in that wilderness, you can be faithful in the promised land. Amen. I'm convinced of that, and I, and I see examples of that if we will diligently do this. That's the only reason why Israel backslid is because they did not diligently keep this. This is the only reason ever why people backslide. I mean, why, why, why in reality would you actually backslide? God... God is good. God is great. God is everything. There's no, there's no legitimate reason to backslide. There's no reason to step down to a lower class. There's no reason to succumb to something that is worth less. There's no logical reason. The only reason and the only thing that can do it is not diligently paying attention and observing the things that God has spoken. And then in verse 19, to cast out all your enemies from before you as the Lord has spoken. When your son asked you in the time to come, saying, what is the meaning of the testimonies and the statutes and the judgments which the Lord your our God has commanded you? Then you shall say to your son, we were, no, the were slaves of Pharaoh, in Egypt, and the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand. And the Lord showed signs and wonders before our eyes, great and severe against Egypt, Pharaoh, and all of his house. So let's pray there because I believe that there's a revelation that God wants to bring out. Because this, is, this should be our answer when people say, why do you live the way you live? Why don't you drink? Why don't you smoke? Why don't you participate in all the things that the world is doing? Why Why don't you do that? What, what reason is there to follow a commandment of the Lord? What, what reason is there to act right? What reason is there to do good? What reason is there to follow these things? Your answer should be your testimony of what God has done for you. Now, I do this because he brought me out of a place that you don't know how dark and how despairing and how wicked and, and how evil that, how, that house of sin and that, that place of bondage and that earthly dwelling of what we would call hell. That's, I'll say that's what the world is because that's the dominion that it's under. That, that house of bondage, you don't know the weight of what I was under, but I was a slave in Egypt. I was a slave in the world, but God stepped in, and this is why I do what I do, because I was lost, but now I'm found. I, I was stung, but now I'm set free. This is why I do what I do. This is a revelation that we need to have. And this is why we can now forget where God has brought us from and what God has done for us. Because people are going to ask when they come when we're in the promised land and say, why? And we must have the revelation that God brought us out of the land of Egypt. Yes, God took me from the world and he can do it for you. This is why we follow him. This is why we do it. Let's pray, church. Father, I thank you for what you're doing. I thank you for what you're saying. I thank you for how you're moving in our midst. I thank you, God. But Lord, I pray that there will be a revelation there. in the book of Revelation that you compared our testimonies as equal weight to the blood with overcoming sin, with overcoming the Antichrist, with overcoming that one, with overcoming wickedness. You compared our testimonies as equal ways that by the blood of the Lamb and the word of, test of their testimony they have overcome. God, I pray that there will be a revelation of sharing our testimony and the power of the testimonies in which we hold, the, the power of the testimony that you came and that you dwell among us, that you came and that you paid the ultimate sacrifice that we could be set free, that you came and you died, but not only did you die, but you rose again on the third day, and, and then uh, 50 days later, you poured out your spirit at Pentecost, that 
Gentiles and Jews alike may come to you. That the whole world can find salvation. God, I pray that we will diligently keep the commands, that we will diligently keep the testimonies, that we will hold tight and that we will love you with all our heart, love you with all our mind and with all our strength. God, I pray that these things will be continually before us. That when we turn to the left and when we turn to the right, that all we see is the goodness and the graciousness and the mercies of our living God. Lord, I pray that you will help us to be bold with your testimony. Help us to be always ready to give an answer for why we live like we live and why we observe the things that we observe. I believe that God is moving us into a place, church. And it's going to happen when we learn to observe the ways and the things of God. It says, and the Lord commanded us to observe all these statutes, to fear the Lord our God for our good. Our good. Not his good. Us, us fearing the Lord and us observing and keeping them stuff, this stuff. Does not add value to God. But what it does is add value to us. Amen. What it does is, is promote something for our yes. good. That he may preserve us alive as it is this day. Then, when? After this. After this. You know, modern Christianity would hate this because they say righteousness comes before you do something because that's how it was apparently for Abraham. But this verse of scripture would contradict that because it says you, you keep these, you observe these, you follow these, you fear the Lord. Then it will be righteousness for us if we are careful. If there's a contingency, I think the proper word would be there. There, there's, there's a balance that if you don't do this, I would argue that the opposite would happen. Right. If, if you don't follow these things, you're not going to have righteousness. You're not going to be counted as righteousness. It's not going to go for your good. It's not going to go for you to be prosperous. You're not going to enter the land. But then it will be righteousness for us if we are careful to observe all the commandments before the Lord our God yes. as he commanded us. Church, there has been commandments not only from Deuteronomy, not only from the books of the prophets, but there has been commandments and, and statutes and things that God has spoken to the church. We heard by the gifts of the Spirit and things that God was speaking in his time, church, that we remember the things and, and we think of the promises and we think of what God is going to do for us and where God wants to lead us. And we think of how we can go and how we can do it. I'll, I'll turn to Matthew. Matthew 28. Because this is, this. I'll prove it, it's not just Old Testament. Because it should be a familiar passage to everybody. Matthew 28 and 19. Go therefore and make disciples. Yeah. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing in the name of the Father and the Son, uh, and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. I won't go into break that down, but this is what I want to break down in verse twenty. Teaching them, teaching them what? To observe. Teaching them to observe all the things which I commanded you. Why would we teach them to observe if this is just an Old Testament principle? It's because it's not just an Old Testament principle. It's not just something for the Old Testament. But this is something for all time. As you teach people what I have commanded you. You go and you make disciples and you baptize them. Yes, and, and they will get the gift of the Holy Ghost. They, they will receive that initial book of Acts thing. But then you teach them to observe. Then once they're in, in the house, once they're in the kingdom. It doesn't end there, but you teach them to observe. That way they may be able to enter the promise. That way they may be able to continue in this walk. That, that way they can move where we're going. That way they can go where we're going. 
It's not just something that the Old Testament is founded on, but observing and keeping the commandments is something that all the Bible hangs on. It's something that the book of Acts hangs on. It's something that the New Testament church hangs on. It's not just left out with, with forgetting it and moving away. And I'm not saying that we haven't been observing and that we haven't been acting right. But what I'm saying is it's time to take a step back on figuring out how we're going to get somewhere. It's time to take a step back and figure out how we're going to move into the promised land. It's time to say, God, I'm going to take my hands off the wheel. It's not a Christian song, but it's time that we let Jesus take the wheel. Take it from my hands. And it's time that we step back and remember that he holds the future. Right. That, he, that he, he can make a way where there is no way. That he can move in ways that we cannot move. That we just got to step back and, and let him be God. Jesus did it his whole, his whole rabbinic ministry. Rabbis in this time when they, when they were traveling, it would be coming for disciples to leave their house for a month or more. And the rabbi often would not tell them where they're going. But he would just lead them. But they just had to remember that the rabbi knew best. That the words that he taught before, the things that he held before, the, the commandments that he gave before, that's what you held on and that's what was going to help you follow the rabbi when it didn't make sense. In Matthew, I'll turn to another scripture in Matthew. Because there is times that we don't know what's going on. There is times that we don't know how life is going to work out. But all we have to do is obey the commandments of the Lord. Matthew 14. I'll start in Matthew 14 and 22. I won't read the whole way through, but I'll just skip through it. We all should know the story of Jesus walking on water and calling Peter. It says, immediately Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side well, he sent the multitudes away. Some of these guys were sailors, we know. They were fishermen. I'm sure they were I'm sure they were knowledgeable of the water. I'm sure that it was probably obvious that a storm was coming. I'm sure it was probably obvious. I don't think this was just a freak storm. I, I like to imagine in my head that a storm was coming and it was obvious by the clouds and obvious by the atmosphere. But Jesus pushed his disciples in. He said, trust me and get into the boat. Trust me and I'll meet you on the other side. Trust me, you will get there even though the storm is happening. Even though this wilderness season is happening. You don't have to know how you're going to get to the other side. You don't have to know what's going to happen between here and there. But just trust my words. Trust my commandments. Trust my statutes and you will get there. Yes. You will get to the other side. And it goes into say that it was the fourth watch in verse 25. It was the fourth watch of the night. Jesus went to them walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled and saying, it is a ghost. And they cried out for fear. I would argue that they cried out for fear because they did not remember the words of Jesus. They did not remember the words of of the Lord, the words of the rabbi when he said, cross over and trust, cross over and go. Just get in this boat. And it says, Peter, but immediately Jesus spoke to them saying, it is, it is be not a, be of good cheer in his eye, do not be afraid. And Peter answered him saying, Lord, if it is you, notice this, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. Why would he say, command me? Why wouldn't he just get out on the water? Because he knows there's power in observing the commandments of the Lord. He knows that if this is truly Jesus, if this is truly God walking on the water, if this is truly the Messiah, when he commands me to get out, when he commands me to come to him, it doesn't matter how I get to him. It doesn't matter what happens, but I know I'm going to get there. Because he's commanded me to get there. He, he spoke to me to get there. So he said, come. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, 
He walked on the water to go to Jesus. He walked on the water. When you obey the commandments of the Lord, you might not know how you're going to get through that storm. You might not know how you're going to get to that place. But if you keep on obeying and diligently remembering the commandments of the Lord, and don't get distracted like it said in, in, in uh, Deuteronomy with false gods. And don't be turned away, but remember the Lord your God. Do not forget him, but remember him. And when you remember and you, and you observe and you diligently keep these things, you can do what Peter did in the first half and begin to walk. But then the opposite happens. It says, when he saw that the wind was boisterous and he was afraid and began to sink, he cried, oh Lord, save me. Why did he begin to sink? It wasn't because Jesus' commandments weren't good enough. It wasn't because Jesus' commandments were not sufficient. They were sufficient to do it once, so they were sufficient to get him there. What happens is he stopped obeying those commandments. He stopped observing those commandments. And he looked around and said, my situation doesn't align with the commandment of the Lord. And he began to look at his ability to walk on the water. It wasn't a lack of Jesus' ability. So when Jesus picks him up and says, why, ye of little faith, oh, ye of little faith, why did you do it? When he picks him up, he wasn't saying, this is, just, this is just my interpretation of it. I don't think you're saying, why did you doubt my ability? Because his ability was there. Peter had confidence in the ability of Jesus. He had confidence in the commandment of the Lord. Otherwise, he wouldn't have said, command me to get on the water. He would have just got on the water. But what I believe that Peter did is he started making an idol of his atmosphere and he started making an idol of himself. Because you don't have the ability to walk to Jesus. You don't have the ability to walk holding the hand of the Savior. You don't have the ability to have righteousness in and of itself, but only following the commandments of God. If it was left up to me, I could never find Jesus. In and of myself, if, if God didn't reach down in, into that sin-filled place that I was in, if God never reached down, I would have never found my way out. It wouldn't have mattered how good I was. It wouldn't have mattered if I stopped drinking, if I stopped smoking, if I stopped doing drugs. It wouldn't have mattered what I got. I would have never found God. Because I can't do it. You can't do it. Contrary to popular belief, none of us are water walker. Water walker. If you can do it, I'll, I'll dump this out. If you say that you can do it, I'll dump it out and I want to see it. I want to see it to believe it. I'll believe it when I see it. But none of us can do that. But it's only when we diligently follow the commandments of the Lord that we have the ability to walk where no one walked before. That we have the ability to walk through that wilderness despite what's going on in the wilderness. Despite everybody backsliding. Despite everybody turning around and everybody walking away. It's when we keep these things in my heart. When they're on my gate. When they're on my doorpost. When they're on in the inside of me. Not when they're in the inside of pastor. He, he's done it. His relationship with God is not going to get me there. Him following the commandments might lead the church. Yeah, it will lead the church. But it's not going to get me there. It's not enough for the man of God to get up on Sunday morning and, and, and preach a, a powerful message for me to get to heaven. It's not enough for me and, and just to sit there and observe and listen to his preaching. It's not enough for me to get there. But I must take it upon myself to diligently keep it and follow the commandments. And at this point in time, I'm not just talking about the commandments. I'm talking about how God tells you to live. How God tells you to act. How God tells you and, and moves you to go. But God is speaking to you. Because we're all in different boats. We're all in different jobs. We're all in different places. So how I do things will not be how you do things. The elders in here... You may not use social media to win somebody to God. It just might not happen. You know, some I, I, I probably am techni technically technically illiterate just as much as you guys, but it's not your generation. Maybe that's not how God is going to use you. He might. I don't know. I really have no idea what God is going to do in each and every one of your life. But what it is, 
It's about you being obedient in the season that you're in and obeying the commandments of the God that of God that you're in. And you following God. That's what will get you to the promise. But if you begin to look at yourself and your ability, you will fall. You will, and I'm coming to a close, Pastor. If you could come to 